It is 6 p.m. and this is the City of Iowa City formal meeting on February 6, 2024. I'm going to call this meeting to order. Roll call, please. Alter? Here. Burgess? Here. Dunn? Here. Harmson? Here. Moe? Here. Sala? Yeah. Teak? Here. Well, welcome to your city hall, to everybody that is present here in person, and hello to everyone that is um, joining us virtually. The second item on the agenda is, sorry, thank you, <laughs> is going to be proclamations, and we have Black History Month as our first proclamation. Whereas with the 2024 theme of African Americans and the arts, Iowa City joins the nation in celebrating Black History Month, which is also known as African American History Month in February. And whereas African Americans have played central roles in some of the most triumphant and courageous moments in the history of our nation, during the month of February, the city recognizes and honors their achievements. And whereas the annual celebration of Black History Month, which showcases achievements by African Americans and, and their roles in the U.S. history, grew out of a National Negro History Week organized in 1916. And whereas organi organizers of the celebration chose the second week of February to coincide with the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, Douglas, of whom was born February 14, 1818. And whereas the first Negro History Week celebration occurred seven years after the founding of the NAACP on February 12, 1909, the centennial anniversary of the birth of Abraham Lincoln. And whereas in 1976, President Gerald Ford officially recognized Black History Month, calling upon the public to seize the opportunity to honor the too often neglected accomplishments of black Americans in every area of endeavor throughout our history. And whereas this February, Iowa City is celebrating Black History Month as a time to honor the contributions and legacy of African Americans. And whereas these important individuals include activists and civil rights pioneers who embodied black resistance and empowered positive changes in education, arts, business, sports, and politics. Now, therefore, I, Bruce Teague, Mayor of Iowa City, do hereby proclaim the month of February 2024 to be Black History Month in Iowa City and encourage you to learn more and explore the city's black history programs and events. Visit the city website at 2024BHM to learn more. And to receive this uh, proclamation is the chair of the Ad Hoc Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Chastity Dillard. Good evening, everyone. I'm Mayor Bruce Teague and City Council members. Again, my name is Chastity Dillard, and I am the Ad Hoc Truth and Reconciliation Commission Chair. Um, it is my pleasure to accept the 2024 Black History Month proclamation. I just want to say that Black History Month is when we celebrate African American accomplishments and the many contributions black Americans have made to this country. It is also the time to acknowledge the history of persons impacted and traumatized by racial injustice and are so to this present day. To move into a future where someone's race can no longer be used to predict their life outcomes, the Iowa City community must take bold actions to confront privilege, stimulate difficult conversations, and reach and engage a complete cross-section of the community, including those in the community not inclined to engage or resistant to engagement. Celebrating black lives and history something is, is something we should do all year long. On behalf of my fellow commissioners, we ask that you study black history and acknowledge the value black residents have added and continue to add to the grit and resiliency of this community. Thank you very much.
The next proclamation to be is Lunar New Year. Whereas Lunar New Year originated in Asian countries more than 4,000 years ago and is celebrated by billions of people across the world, including the United States, during the first new moon of the calendar in February each year. And whereas Lunar New Year is an official state holiday in California, Colorado, New Jersey, New York, and there is an opportunity for other states to adopt this official state holiday to recognize the culture and positive contributions of the Asian and Pacific Islander communities. And whereas Lunar New Year has been officially listed as a United Nations holiday in the UN calendar of conferences and meetings starting in 2024. It is celebrated by residents from China, Vietnam, Korea, Singapore, Malaysia, Bruneia, and Mongolia, and millions of worldwide with community activi activities, <coughs> cultural performances, and the reunification of family and friends. And whereas Lunar New Year is an opportunity for people to learn about AAPI cultures and traditions, especially in the light of the rise in hate crimes against the AAPI communities. Now, therefore, I, Bruce Teague, mayor of the city of Iowa City, do hereby proclaim the first new moon of the calendar year on February 10th, 2024, to be Lunar New Year in Iowa City and recognize the cultural and, and historical significance of Lunar New Year, the Year of the Dragon, and expresses our deepest appreciation for the APA, PA, and the Asian American Pacific Islanders and all individuals who celebrate this significant occasion and wish Asian American Pacific Islanders and all individuals who observe this holiday a happy and prosperous year. And to receive this is going to be uh, Nali, president of the Eastern Iowa Chapter Asian and Pacific Islander American Public Affairs Association. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, yes, I am the president of APAPA. APAPA -A -A stands for Asian and Pacific Islander. This is a long name. Let me think. Pacific Islander Americans Public Affairs Association. Uh, we have more than. Uh, 30 chapters around the United States. Um, so in Coralville, we have about 2,006 Asian, and in Iowa City, it doubles, um, 4,260. Um, so we have about 7K Asians in this area who are grateful that Iowa City recognized this most important holiday of Asian countries. And in return, we are going to celebrate it in English Theater on the Super Bowl day, which is Sunday. I know you guys love Super Bowl, and you also love us. So we hope to see you there. Uh, some of the councils went last year, and they enjoyed it, and some of the council members tell me they are coming this year. So I hope to see you there, and also everybody here. What time on Sunday? Uh, it's from 4 to 5.30. The Super Bowl starts at 5.30, so you may miss the beginning. Um, <laughs> we try to end it uh, earlier. Maybe we can end at 5.15, so <laughs> give you time to go back. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you. Yeah. All right, and thanks to both of you for coming and accepting those proclamations. We're going to move on to our consent agenda, which is items three through seven. Can I get a motion to approve, please? Uh, I'd like to remove an item. Oh. Uh, yeah, if, if we okay. could. Uh, I'd like to remove 6J. Okay. For a separate consideration. Yes, please. And I need to recuse myself from that one as well. 6 J. Oh, yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> Perfect. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um, could I get a motion to approve the consent agenda items three through seven, except for 6 J? So moved. Uh, 
Second. Moved by Dunn, seconded by Sala. Um, anyone from the public like to address uh, any of those topics? Seeing no one in person, and if you're online, please raise your hand and I'll recognize you. If you want to. Your virtual hand, of course. Seeing no one in person or online, council discussion. Mayor, I think we have someone who might yeah. be interested in speaking. Two. Mm -hmm. Come on up. Oh, please. Yes, if you're wanting to speak on an item that is in our consent agenda, please come to the podium at this time. And we'll ask that um, there's a sign-in sheet and you'll be given up to three minutes. Is this the right time for me to speak? Mm -hmm. can, you, can you clarify the actions that were just taken? Which, which action item are you trying to speak on? Is it okay if I sp speak after? Yeah. So, so the, the action items that we're on right now is our consent agenda and their items three through seven with the exception of 6J. Um, which includes 6K, which is a settlement agreement. Which includes 6K, Can I speak which is after, a or? settlement agreement approval. May I speak after? Or? Uh, you can speak at this time. If, if, you, if you want. If you want to speak to one of the items that is part of that, you need to speak now. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And Yep. And there is a sign-in sheet. We'll ask that you give your, yep, we'll ask that you give your name and the city you're from. And then you'll be uh, given up to three minutes. I signed here, so. Welcome. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Teague and, and Council. My name is Sandy McDowell, resident of, of Coralville, and I am the unnamed former employee of Item 6K. Um, my story is, is one of care and appreciation for many aspects of the people and service of the Iowa City Fire Department and a belief that we could be and do better. An example I tried to share over and over again was this, you see, just as we had a policy for backing our ladder truck and fire engines into the bays with a spotter, someone who had a different perspective than the driver, a unique point of view to protect and prevent accidents or harm, so too must be said is needed for a quality and safe working environment in the Iowa City Fire Department with the matching service it provides to all. I received all sorts of learning and help from peers in over a decade of living and working together. My belief at the time was that it was a reciprocated exchange that others too were learning and receiving help from me. In the end, parts of what makes me me and what makes me different than the majority of the Iowa City Fire Department members disallowed me from doing my job as both the spotter and the driver. My voice and perspective were silenced and removed from the Iowa City Fire Department. But this does not have to be the end of the story for the evolution of the ICFD and its service to its community. I challenge you one final time, whoever you are, to do what you can to support an equitable culture within the walls of each fire station and an equitable treatment of all people who ask for help from public servants in Iowa City. Thank you. Thank you.
anyone else like to address a topic that is on our consent agenda except for 6J? Seeing no one in person or online virtually with their hand raised, council discussion. Jeff, could we get some more um, clarification on, or like just a better idea of the situation with, oh, where was it? Uh, 7B, please. Um, I'm sorry, did you say 7B? Is yeah, it, it just, it kind of confused me a little bit going through it, so if you could just, it, it's setting a hearing, so it's not right. that big a deal. Uh, well, Sorry, yes, it's setting the hearing for next uh, uh, council meeting and I'll be sending out a memo uh, to the council, which will be public, uh, to lay out the uh, legal standards that are present for uh, such an appeal. So you uh, will have an idea how that works as will the uh, appellant in that case. And obviously if you have any questions uh, about procedure, I'd be happy to address those as okay. well. Okay. Hearing no more discussion. Roll call, please. Sala? Yes. Teague? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Mo? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Um, uh, Councilor Burgess is going to recuse herself. Could I get a motion to approve from the consent agenda 6J? So moved. Second. Moved by Don, seconded by um, Alter. <laughs> All right, uh, council discussion. Oh, I'm sorry, public discussion, yes. Whoops. Yes. Good evening, my name's Jim Throgmorton. I live in Iowa City. I was thrilled to hear about the lunar celebration. Uh, three members of my family are of Chinese descent, so it's pleasing to be able to help celebrate that with them. Uh, I come here as a chair of the Northside Neighborhood Association with regard to item 6J, uh, not to support it, not to oppose it. We don't know enough about it actually to do either one, uh, which actually is why I'm here. We did not know that this project was being proposed until five days ago when the agenda came out and suddenly we learned that there was an item on the agenda that involved nine possible lots and two out lots uh, half a block away from where I live but also right next door to several people who are members of the uh, uh, who live in the north side so um, we were surprised so I just I'm here to seek clarification basically so the surprise for me was that there was no preliminary plant considered. So uh, I think there's an explanation for that, but I don't know what it is, and I'd like to have it articulated publicly, because normally you go through a preliminary plant, the public knows what's going on, you have an opportunity to talk to other people about whether it's a good idea or not, uh, and then the pro final plant comes to the city council, and it's an administrative thing, you just vote yes. But it could, uh, would someone please explain uh, uh, why there was no preliminary plat? And then the second thing has to do with whether the absence of a preliminary plat represents any uh, continuing thing that would affect all future developments in Iowa City. So in other words, will there be preliminary plats coming forth or just leaping into final plats? So could someone help explain that, please? Thank you. Anyone else like to address this topic? Seeing no one in person, and if you're online virtually, again, just raise your hand. Seeing no one online, council discussion. Jeff, would you be able to speak to that? Sure, I'll ask, I'll ask Danielle to come up and, and help, but this is not a change in practice. This is a routine uh, procedure, and Danielle can give a little background on why we're at the final plat stage. Sure. So 
The planning process, also called subdivisions, is a process governed by our ordinances in Chapter 15. Its purpose is ultimately to provide for the regulation and control of extension of public improvements, public services and utilities, and the improvement of land and design of subdivisions, consistent with the comp plan as amended from time to time. Uh, this particular property was part of the original plan of Iowa City, drawn up in the late 18, 1800s and recorded in the early 1900s. Um, it's presumed, since it's already gone through a subdivision and planning process, that any process of the day similar to our process now of preliminary planning was accomplished at, at that time. When we have land in the city that's already been platted, uh, recorded plat on file. If it were to be subdivided further, we consider that a refinal plat. So this is the process of a refinal plat of that land. Um, the current uh, development of that area already has all of the necessary streets installed. So honestly, it's a minor plat at this point. There's not much public infrastructure being added. It's already a block within the city with access to roads. Um, and it has several um, existing homes on it. Um, the additional lots would infill around those existing homes and add approximately six more lots for development and additional park land to be added to the city park adjacent to it. So this is a refinal plat. It's a typical process that we go through for, as I've said, land that's been platted once before. Any questions for Daniel? Thank you. All right, council discussion. Roll call, please. Teague? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? I'm sorry. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Moe? Yes. Saleh? Yes. Motion uh, passes six to zero. We are at, at we're at item number eight, which is community. Mm -hmm. Could we get a motion to accept correspondence? For yes. 7A? Okay. So move to accept correspondence. Yes. Uh, mo <laughs> All right. So motion to accept correspondence for 7A. Yeah, we move then second. All right. So move by Sala. Second. Second. By Alter. Is that what I heard? Yes. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes seven to zero. We're on to item number eight, which is community comment. This is an opportunity for individuals to make a comment on anything that is not on our agenda. Um, and this will only be for those that are in person. Um, so you're gonna be allowed up to three minutes uh, to speak and we ask people to sign in and give us your name and city you're from. Welcome. Hey folks, uh, Brandon Ross from Iowa City. Um, I just want to bring up on African American Month, uh, Martin Luther King said a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. He said this in 1967. Uh, we know he was assassinated in 1968. Some people think it was because he wanted equal rights. Uh, there were other reasons why. He was criticizing U.S. imperial actions in Vietnam, uh, and he was also speaking about capitalism uh, and that uh, socialistic solutions were better. So he was a very diverse and very rich man and one of the greatest Americans in this country. He also said in 1967, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world is my own government today, the United States. Right now, uh, our government is, uh, is occupying, uh, bombing or arming uh, countries all over the world, but there are four in particular. We're occupying Syria, uh, a larger uh, space of, uh, of Syria than the Donbass area in Ukraine, which the U.S. Uh, says that Russia has, uh, has invaded and occupied. Uh, we, are, we have actually started bombing Yemen, which is against international laws as well. We are breaking international laws there. We shouldn't be in Yemen. We shouldn't be bombing those people. Those people have not bombed us, and why are we there? Uh, Ukraine, uh, which I've mentioned many times. Uh, we, we basically changed the regime in uh, 2014. We sponsored that. We armed uh, the Kiev regime uh, for eight years until Russia interceded on behalf of eastern Ukraine. That was against international law. That violated sovereignty. That was against U.S. law. Uh, 
Um, and then Palestine, of course. Uh, the U.S. right now is arming Israel. Israel is obliterating Gaza and obliterating Palestine. What Dr. King would say to see today would not be very different from what he saw before he died, tragically. And that is that the United States is a criminal internationally. It doesn't matter what, uh, what, what it is, whether it's Democrat or Republican. They're both at fault. I mean, let's face it. I mean, during, uh, during the Bush-Cheney administration, we went into Iraq and Afghanistan. Those were illegal engagements. Internationally, those were illegal. But the UN could do nothing with us because we have all the money, we have all the power. And, uh, you know, then it continued. Bar Barack Obama bombed, bombed eight countries at once, okay? And he actually was the president when, when we um, changed regime in Libya. We, we took out Muammar Gaddafi and we killed him. That was international crime. We took out Yanukovych in 2014 in Ukraine. That's an international crime. I say to people, we need to tell our government to please stop arming, uh, please stop arming Israel, stop arming Ukraine, get out of Syria, get out of Yemen. We are breaking the law. And we have to take responsibility, and I just plead with people to do so. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, a good book for you guys to read. Thank you. Ukraine Thank you. and the Crossfire. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Speak up. Be heard. Act. Welcome. Hello, my name is Clara Reinen. I'm an, uh, a resident of Iowa City. Um, I didn't have anything prepared today, but I felt compelled to speak after being at the state capitol today for the subcommittee meeting of HSB 649, which uh, many of my friends and family members in the trans community are calling the pink triangle bill, um, because although the driver's license segment was amended, um, would still require transgender uh, people to list um, the sex they were assigned at birth and the gender they have transitioned to as well. Um, and I think it's kind of wild to be standing in front of you today and to be able to draw such a clear connection to the ongoing erasure of trans people in Iowa and the direct violence that we are seeing the police in Iowa City and Act against members of the trans community. I was one of the protesters arrested at Kinnick Stadium on December 9th, and seeing the way that the police treated my transgender friends compared to the way they treated me is absolutely unacceptable. I cannot believe we are even entertaining giving the police more money when the only thing I have seen them do is enact violence, hateful speech, oppression, and a whole list of other things that I consider wildly un-American and wildly unconstitutional. Iowa City has been a place that for most of my life I've held dear. Growing up in Burlington, Iowa, my friends and I would drive to Iowa City on the weekends to watch improv shows, to go shopping for school clothes, to get out of a small town and be somewhere else where we felt like we would be accepted and fit in and be safe. And I would just ask that as members of city council, you stay committed to protecting transgender Iowans and to protecting marginalized groups of people that are targeted by the police, especially in Black History Month. If there's one thing we've learned, it's that the struggle of oppressed and marginalized groups are not disconnected. They are interrelated. Um, and I guess to finish um, with another book recommendation, because why not? Um, if you haven't, I would really recommend that you read um, by Angela Davis, Freedom is a Constant Struggle, uh, Ferguson, Palestine, and the Foundations of a Movement. It was very helpful for myself in clarifying how the actions of the Israeli government uh, and the police in the United States are inherently linked. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Please give your uh, name and city you're from. Hi, my name is Maeve Reinen. I'm from Iowa City. We come back again to ask for explanations and increased transparency regarding the city's police department budget. 
various work sessions, conversations with city council and staff, and collective research cannot make up for the lack of information out there regarding how this money is being used. Not only do we not know how this money is being used, but it continues to increase as we ask why. In 2022, Iowa City Police Department spent $7 million more on patrol expenditures than any other department. In addition, the police budget has continued to increase in fiscal year 22, 23, 24, 25, and the proposed budget for fiscal year 26 shows no sign of this trend stopping. How can you plan for an egregious $470,000 increase in police expenditures in 2026 when crime, and specifically crime that could be theoretically managed by patrol services, has been decreasing for years. Traffic stops, arrests, citations, use of force incidents, and calls for service have all decreased or stayed stagnant going back to 2016 and beyond. Why then does the budget keep increasing? And while we, concerned citizens, seek adequate transparency into the details of the report and the budget, the city and police department have proposed a budget increase of $40,000 to install license plate reading cameras around town. Multiple council members showed opposition nearly immediately, and we Iowa City residents feel the same way. We were assured that these cameras would not be used to administer tickets. We were also told that they would be managed by a third party. This does not seem like a recipe for success. No one here wants increased surveillance in town, and no one here is naive enough to think that these cameras won't be used against us to further extract money and resources down the line. We have all read through the strategic plan at this point. What is the progress being made on the items in the action plan? The plan mentions actions needing to be significant and visible to the community. The paltry scraps you've thrown towards us is neither of those things. How are community violence intervention efforts proceeding? What is the future of community mobile crisis and how will it be made more accessible? Have we considered or implemented alternatives to routine non-emergent traffic stops? You need to take our concerns seriously. We are not the first to ask for more transparency and we will not be the last. With the general fund, you have the power to make real, tangible change in people's lives and our community. You need to listen to the residents and to the objective reality that increased policing and police spending is not making us safer. There are so many other ways we can keep all of us safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to everyone that came and spoke today. We're gonna move on to items number nine, which is planning and zoning matters. 9A is rezoning Moss Ridge Road. Ordinance conditionally rezoned in approximately 61.72 acres of land located north of I-80, west of North Dodge Street at the end of Moss Ridge Road from Research Development Park Zone, Interim Development Research Park Zone, and a highway commercial with a planned development overlay zone to intensive commercial zone. This is a second consideration, and the applicant is requesting expedited action. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, I move that the rule, or wait, yeah, this is the first one, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I move that the rule requiring that ordinance must be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended, that the first consideration and, and vote be waived, and that the ordinance be given second consideration in a vote at this time. Moved by Don. Second. Seconded by Mo. Anyone like to address this topic from the public? If you're on online, please again raise your hand virtually. Seeing no one in person or online, council discussion. Roll call, please. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Mo? Yes. Saleh? Yes. Teague? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Could I get a motion to pass and adopt? So moved. Second. Moved by Dunn, seconded by uh, Salah. Uh, roll call, please. Burgess? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Mo? Yes. Saleh? Yes. Teague? Yes. Alter? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Could I get a motion to accept correspondence? So moved. Second. Second. Moved by Alter, seconded by, I'll give it to Don. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes seven to zero. Item number 10, um, A is Home ARP Amendment number four, 
to fiscal 21 annual action plan resolution approving substantial amendment number four to the Iowa City's fiscal year 21 annual action plan. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So moved. Second. Moved by Alter, seconded by Mo. Or me, but that's okay. Harmson, oh. second by Harmson. Seconded by Harmson. Mo went to shaking his head. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, we're going to have uh, staff come up, so welcome. Thanks. Uh, Sam Turnbull, Grant Specialist. So this is the third time the Home ARP allocation plan has been before you guys. The first time um, was the original allocation plan. The second time was an amendment, and this is an additional amendment due to HUD feedback. So Iowa City was awarded $1,789,981 dollars in home ARP funds from the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. Um, that first allocation plan was approved by City Council on August 16th, 2022. Um, staff has worked with multiple HUD representatives to fulfill the program requirements because they are changing as this is a new program. Um, in August, August 15th, 2023, at the regular meeting, a second draft was approved by City Council. This is a new draft with new HUD feedback for us that changes some of the budget and programs planned under our allocation plan. Um, we learned that a couple of our programs were not allowable under home ARP funds, and so we have revised the Shelter House proposed project, and we are funding the United Action for Youth proposed project with uh, local funds instead. And then we also learned that the state um, home ARP funds no longer need a local match in home ARP, and so we removed that from the agenda, I mean, from the budget. So those are the changes that we made, and we reallocated that additional funding to the existing programs in the budget. I guess my question is, when you say we allocate it to the existing programs, did like, they ask for it, or? They, a, a couple of them had asked for it, and then we did check with them and make sure that they were able to use the additional funding. But did you, like, tell the rest of the community, like, another program that do the same thing? Maybe they did not receive any fund before, and... We didn't do an additional, like, request for proposals. I don't know. I think that really unfair for the other organizations in the community who are doing struggling and doing good work in this community. And if they are eligible, and we, we fund those organizations in many ways during this, uh, like during ABRA money, that's what I want to say. If I, if I could jump mm -hmm. in, just to clarify, these are not um, discretionary ARPA dollars. These are funded specifically to the HOME uh, program, which focuses uh, very intently on the homeless, near homeless population. So, uh, I understand the service, that, Jeff. I, I, I really just, do. I'm just clarifying for, for everybody. Um, the uh, decision that we made not to go back out was um, based on the quality of the applications we had, the need that we thought they had, and uh, knowing that there was not a large swath of service providers out there that work with uh, the homeless, near homeless population on a regular basis. I don't know, not only the shelter houses are working with the homeless, there is many many another type of homeless in this community. And the shelter house is not the only one receiving this award. That's what I'm saying, you know, is... Uh, Maybe, know. Sam, can you yeah. um, speak a little bit to the eligibility requirements? My understanding is that there aren't a whole lot of organizations in our community that are eligible for these types of funds. Can you speak Yeah, to the that? types of services that we're allowed to fund with this are non-congregate non shelter, supportive services, um, for homeless and near homeless, and um, I believe also um, low-income rental housing. Mm -hmm. is there, there is a, many people that, I'm sorry, Megan, go ahead, go ahead. No, uh, no I, I said something you have to say. No. I, I just wondered about the timeline for when these funds have to be dispersed. Yeah, I would have to check on that and get back, but I know we've been working on the plan for a couple of years now, and I think we have. Jeff, do you know for sure when we have to expend Legal these? Uh, I assume they align with most of the other ARPA programs, which is obligation by the end of the year, spent by 26, but we'd have to confirm that. 
I, I heard you guys before. You said that in many another Arab fund. You said, yeah, like, I think June, series or something like that. You have to allocate it by that time. December 2024 is the most Even? of ARPA funds, yep. We still have more time to think about this, I think. Um, this is a slightly different tact from, I think, where you were going. However, I also um, am glad that there's a little bit of time, and I apologize that I wasn't able to um, request this information in advance of the meeting. Um, but. I was wondering if there have been, because uh, I understand that these, has the program for Shelter House, we, we gave them a million one last dis January, correct? Or I'm not sure. I, I, I believe I believe that's correct, um, roughly. Um, and so I was wondering, you know, what metrics do we have for how the, the program has been doing? Um, and equally, um, since there's a subcontractor um, component to it with Iowa Legal Aid, um, as well as themselves having a, sort of one of their primary services is actually working on eviction prevention as well. I was c kind of hoping to get some information about the work that they've been doing um, with current dollars that they have. have. Um, I think that's more the ARP, the regular ARPA funds that's that we've been funding ARP. them with. Yeah. Well, uh, I will be honest that I think that would be good information to have based on then what more is being suggested. That's it in, seems that's very... in my ARPA update. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we would have presented a little bit on that in, uh, I believe, late December was the last time About we did a quarterly update with council. And we can do a deeper dive with Shelter House if that's required on that eviction prevention piece. Uh, if, you, if, if you'd like more than we presented at that time uh, going forward, um, we can certainly. Sure. I mean, I will certainly, I'll go back and look at that. And thank you for the, the sort of the yeah. calendar update of where I can look. I appreciate that. Um, and but this yeah. shelter house funding is, isn't actually for eviction prevention. This is for um, already housed individuals who are at risk of homelessness to receive case management supportive services. Okay. Sam, what was it about the UAY project that that had to be shifted to local funds and yeah, wasn't um, one of, for this? Yeah, one of HUD's major um, concerns for a couple of our projects was that we couldn't use home ARP funding for supportive services at a non-home ARP funded site exclusively. So UAY wanted to use the home ARP supportive services funding for their existing transitional living program site. And because that site wasn't funded with home ARP dollars, we couldn't use the home ARP dollars for the supportive services at that site. Um, and so that's why we had been funding the UAY Transitional Living Program Supportive Services with local funds, and we'll continue to do that until we satisfy their request, since it's not eligible. The other issue was HUD was concerned that having a preference for youth was a fair housing violation, so they didn't let us um, include that in the plan. Yeah, I just want to ask you, I think also it will help, like, uh, it will, to pay for rental assistance, it will be eligible under that. Am I right? Tenant-based rental assistance yes. is a possibility. I don't think it was one of the programs that was funded with this um, funding. But it's still, if you if we allocate that for, like, renter assistance, for, like, all this kind of thing, it's still eligible that, from the way that I read it. It's a home ARP eligible expense, but I don't think it was something that was granted with um, the request for proposals for this funding. She's saying we could do something different. Yes, yeah. that's exactly, do something different. You, I think to do, do something, something totally different, we'd have to redo the allocation plan again, which would take many, many months. That's fine, we have until the end of the year. So recall that this process is working through your HCDC as well. So you're going to want to engage them if, if you go down this path. But um, yeah, the H, this the... has been through the HC, HCDC scoring. We put it out for public comment in January, and, and this is where we are today. So if you want to restart that process, you are looking at several months. Could, yeah, could you actually flesh that out more? Could you articulate what the entire process timeline would be? Or is that something that we should have? Um, I, I, um, 
I'm we, sorry. We'd have to post, I mean, typically, I think we post 30 to 45 days to receive proposals for something like this, and then your HCDC would need time to, your staff would first review those for compliance purposes. We'd prevent them and present them to HCDC. They would take a meeting or two, however long they need, to make recommendations. Um, the amendment process is what we just went through. Um, the staff memo notes that we put uh, the public comment notice out on January 11th, so about a month or so of public comment, um, three, four months at least. And Just to oh, go ahead. Uh, I, and, and building on that question of timeline, the, it, we're, I think that Mm -mm. Um, we're talking about just three hundred and forty-six thousand dollars. It's of concern right now of unallocated funds. It's a, that that's the batch that you're concerned about. What? The three hundred and forty-six thousand seven hundred and thirty-nine dollars of unallocated funds are the ones that you're concerned were redistributed yes. without an additional process. Um, mm -hmm. Can you distribute the balance of those funds less the three hundred and forty-six thousand dollars and do a secondary process for that amount, or does it need to be done at once? There's your amount. 1.4, yeah, the 1.4 million, can it be distributed immediately and then the remainder done later? We'd have to submit, our allocation plan contains a budget for what services we're providing with each um, amount that has to go through HUD, and so I don't, we'd have to at least designate what services those funds are going to to submit our plan to HUD and be able to move forward with any of them. It can't be done piecemeal, it has right. to be done, that's what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. I, I guess one question is, of these reallocated funds, is it possible to give that back to HCDC who made the recommendations for, you know, review the applications, made the rec recommendations to council? Could we give that back to HCDC just to know that they have, you know, some funds that can be reallocated and then, um, so I guess one, that is a process that we could take. Yeah, they meet next in March, and so that would delay. Um, mm -hmm. We would have them meet in March and do that, and then we would come back to you all, um, and then we would be able to submit our plan to HUD. So are you suggesting that they, essentially we send it back to them to say, is this the way that you want to allocate this, or look uh, again? Yes, just look again. But, uh, but it's, it's still that's not gonna solve the problem. Because I, uh, what I mean really, let us open it to another, like allocate it to something else, or open it to, of course when you allocate it to somebody, you're gonna open it for the public again. That's what I mean. Uh, but, but now you just like give it to certain organization and that's it. And I just wanna tell you something in this community, like w if we talked about the last arbonoid that has been distributed, we have a lot of low income family that they cannot pay the rent. Call, you can go and ask crisis center, community crisis center about their waiting list when it comes to deposit and everything. And uh, you know, a lot of people, they can, the general assistant, they've been receiving a lot of application that people in need of like paying the rent. Those people who are living in their house and they can be homeless. And you said the whole goal of this money is to prevent people from become homeless, which is there is many things that we can do to do this. But uh, it doesn't have to be like completely homeless so we can, solve the problem. And I feel like when it comes to immigrants and people of color right now for the Arba money, I don't think those people get anything. Was it just beside maybe the center for work I guess to get for community organizer or something like that. But each of the application that being uh, applied, that the immigrants community are not getting anything from this. You know, it have to be like an uh, organization that led by yes, Borodomo and white people in this community so they can get something. And, and you said you have it on the advertising for one month. Who know about it? You know, I don't know about it. And I feel like I, I'm on the council member and also in the same time, I am a, a community organizer and I know about the community. I wasn't know anything about this. So one of the questions I'll pose again is this, HCDC was the one that looked at all of the initial applications. Yes. So there's, you know, two things that I, I think I would, you know, ask council to consider. One would be we can ask them to look at the, you know, re-look at allocating these funds to agencies that have already 
apply, just re-pull up the applications. Maybe staff can call and make sure everybody is interested or maybe they have the discussion and, you know, see if they can reallocate the funds. Or, um, you know, the applications could be reopened for the funds that we have remaining and people can either resubmit or submit new uh, opportunities for this fund. Question of clarification. So this would, both of those would entail approximately two or three months? Is that well, your judgment, Jeff? I, just to, to clarify, the, the HCDC has seen this draft. Yeah. Um, they uh, were going to meet in January on it and it was canceled mm -hmm. due to weather in order to keep us on the time frame that we're on. Uh, the staff sent out a note to HCDC commission members and said, if you have any comments on this, please let us know. Otherwise, we're going to proceed in going to council. And uh, to my knowledge, we didn't receive, we didn't any, receive comments. any comments. So from this is not this is not new to the to the HCDC. They they have had a chance to see this. It just they didn't have their meeting because it was canceled. Um, and again, if we just pull this back a little bit. Um, uh, this this plan that's in front of you has already been two, three times approved by council. So this th there has been a long public process to get us to this point. We are now just at that final stage where we reallocated money that we held back from those awards um, because we felt they could be helpful if the state put out a program that required a local match. We wanted to have a pot of money to be able to help somebody apply for that state home art program. That wasn't needed. So we were going through the process and why we're here today is to say we don't need this local match anymore let's sup let's further supplement those applications that we have so those are points of clarification you can certainly send it back to hcdc but understand they've already seen it and and again i was just referring to looking at the applications that have already come forth and then hcdc going through the process of you know re-looking to see how they will allocate this 346. Mayor Pro Tem, is your concern that there are organizations who didn't have the opportunity to apply in the first place or that their applications were not funded? Yeah, they don't have the opportunity to apply. I, I, you know, we don't know about it. Some people, they don't know about it. Some organization, they don't know about it. And, and to be honest with you, if you look at all the application normal, all the organization that normally apply, it's not immigrants because they don't know about it. They don't know about it. And they are historically are the people who either did, did receive like minimum amount of funding or not funding at all. Just look at the, the, the Arba money, the $4 million. Who get that? I, I understand all of those people, they, they really do an amazing job. I'm not dis distributing that. But I feel like we being, if I look at all the time, all the organization get, and look at the organization that they don't receive any fund or minimum fund, will be the immigrants-led organization. And, and this is, the, the ARPA money, I don't think as immigrants people in this community, they benefit out from it. I was trying when I was even at the Center for Okay Justice trying to apply for ARBA fund. I reached out to all those organizations to partner with them. I've been told that they serve different people and we serve different people. Then, if they serve different people, that means they don't serve immigrants because we were serving immigrants. You know, I don't know, but this is, this is really something that we have to talk about it. We have to open it. It's a hard conversation, I understand, and I value all the number of the organization in this town. They really provide amazing job, amazing opportunity, like service for the people in general. But the people who really left, like, uh, by, like they push out of the American and they fell on the crack all the time, is a immigrant-led organization. Uh, that's why I think is there, if there, we are not going to find another opportunity like this opportunity. And we struggle as a city for money. We just said the budget is not enough. We want to do a lot of things, but we don't have money. And if we have some like this money, that, that's opportunity, we can do something that to make all the people feel included. We don't feel included in this community. 
and I can do a study. If you give me time, I can go and give you maybe five years of funding, how the organization being funded. Oh, no representation in commission like CIC, HCDC. Okay, there is no representation. Of course, no representation. Nobody will know what the immigrant organization are doing. I, I don't know, but I really think and they're seeing this. That's why if we have a power to change something, let us do it. So I think we're left with the question, uh, Council, of where, where, you know, what do we want to do for the 346, how do we want to proceed? Do we, you know, I think there are some avenues. If there can, if I can get one point of clarification. If applications are opened or if applications are reviewed by HCDC, how does that affect you all? I know that we have until the end of the year, we'll say, to allocate this fund. We wouldn't be able to submit the plan to HUD until we have clarification on those How budget line okay. items. Okay, got it. What's and the, then, oh, go ahead. So we can't enter any agreements for the for the funded programs until we have submitted the plan to HUD. And then additionally, you said that uh, does HUD need to review? Yeah. And what's the timeline for HUD to review as well? So. Have, I think they have 30 days, but they've told us they're going to be fast because this is our third submission, right. and so they're very familiar with our plan. But if it's a totally different plan, or a, a right. substantial, I know that there's a very technical term of substantial amendment, but yeah. I'm using it in a layman's term, so if yes. there's a substantial amendment to it, like that we've done something more creative, yeah. opened it back up, and it would be different than what they are intending, that they're yes. assuming that they'll see, yeah. then that timeline could be stretched out. Yeah. Their because response they've looked time. at this, and they've told us this Right, but if they see something different, it will take them longer. Yeah. I'm sorry, I drew that out too long. Are, are, we, del are we delaying distribution of funds to these organizations yes. if we do that? Yeah. So yeah. I mean, that's, that's what I have in my head, is what pain is this causing to the organizations? We've funded them in 2021, and we've been trying to get the plan through to HUD since then. No, can, we cannot do it partially. Like, can we send the one that we already allocated? Not if we're pulling out other funds and we don't know what they're doing with them, because we have to say what we're doing with the funds and the Can we say plan. we're going to open another process for this amount only? I think if we knew that we were going to use that for supportive services or we knew that we were going to use that for tenant-based rental assistance, we could do that, but we don't know what it's going to be for. But we, we can say that. we If we want to do it for rent assistance, we can say rent all the illegible thing that HUD will allow, whether it is rent assistance or just like homeless or anything. Can we just say we're going to allocate that for that and after that submit everything and leave this and we can talk about it later? I think we have to put a, a line item, put it on a line item, um, specifying what we're using it for. Maybe renter assistance, maybe like, yeah, uh, funding organization that uh, like house people. And I will prefer renter assistance even because there is many people you can go and just ask the community crisis center, ask general assistant, and see how many people on the waiting list, and there is no fund. Even like uh, community crisis center, they they you don't have you cannot find appointment even because the people are really in great need. I think let's just do like renter assistance for people, and if that will really allow us to proceed fast so that as organization can receive their money. So it seems like there is, a, so there's possible solution by saying, for instance, to, to earmark that money, the 346,000 for rental assistance, right? And you also want it to be opened up so that immigrant organizations would administer that? They can apply Is, for it. Or having a, a chance so, to apply. They okay, have a chance, a chance to, to apply. apply. I said, okay. Everyone else can have a chance to apply, including immigrant organizations. With this line. 
Mm. I feel just like some kind of assistance for low-income and immigrant people in this community. They are struggling so hard. There is many immigrants get to become homeless the first seven days that they arrive. This seems like, um, you know, we don't know who submitted applications, you know, right now at this yeah, moment. I wasn't here at that time, so I couldn't right. tell you. Mm -hmm. Right. Not so. We could get you that information, but we don't have that right now. Yeah. For me to make an informed decision, I'm just, all I can think about is the timeline of like how much time it's going to take to get there. Because I really appreciate the, the perspective that you brought to this, and I hadn't thought of that, and I don't have enough information about your questions to feel really informed, like what was the process initially, and why didn't they apply uh, the immigrant groups? I, I don't know that. Um, and what I also like. don't know right now is how much of the, de how, how big the delay is. I think we've kind of heard Six months? It's impossible to tell you what that is because we're interfacing with, with HUD. Again, we submitted our original plan in August of 21, and for two years we've been trying to get approval on that initial plan. So we feel like this is the last step and we can start to work on those agreements and get these funds flowing at this point. If we change course, that there's just a there's a risk that it could take more. It may not, as as Sam said, HUD's, HUD HUD is anxious for us to get to the finish line too. So we expect that they're going to um, be able to approve it quick. But they also expect us to come back with these final uh, clarifications. They're familiar with the uses of funds that we're proposing. If we change course, they may not be um, as quick because they may have to. Ex explore, you know, different angles that they haven't done with us before. So I can't give you, you an exact said, answer. You just said it's okay. You can, if we, if we find out exactly what we're going to, what was the purpose of that money, which is left, we can still submit the application. I can that submit way. the plan, but it would look different than what HUD's already reviewed. So I'm not sure what they would say back to us. But if we really just put the information for the, like the legible criteria, you said renter assistance is one of them, right? Yeah. Okay. If we know that this is an illegible criteria, why we think it will be rejected? HOMARP is a program with a lot of rules, and it's a new program, and so that's why we've already gotten this plan sent back to us twice is because they're figuring out the rules as we're writing the plan. Um, I have a question, Jeff, um, I can't, or anyone. I cannot remember how much funding we have not allocated of our 18.3 million ARPA funds. Is it like 4 million? Um, that hasn't been committed? Oh, well, 4 million, that's going to the... No, it's, um, not, it's not that much. No, I mean, it's not that much. I think it's around two. Yeah. I just did the update that you haven't seen yet. So, yeah, so we, we have $2 million of the 18.3 million ARPA funds that we can still discuss all the opportunities, you know, that, you know, council went through and outlined that we can use those funds for. I do think um, we can certainly, um, I want to validate, you know, um, what I've heard, um, some of those challenges, absolutely. We want to make sure that you know, we are doing the best that we can with this one-time opportunity, it is. But I, I also know that there are, you know, there are people that have been waiting for these funds since, you know, 2021. Um, I'm, I, I think I'm more inclined to do either approve it, because, you know, the services are needed. There is no doubt that what the staff um, is suggesting at this point, there is no doubt that the funds um, are needed, can be critically used for serving all types of uh, individuals within our community, including the immigrant community. Um, but either we, I'm either okay with, you know, approving this or, 
asking HCDC just to look at the applications and that were already submitted and reallocate those funds. That's kind of where I am at this point. Were you suggesting with the um, the money that we have not yet spent? Yes, we with, can with, it. with ARPA dollars that truly are under our control, even though there are still rules, but they're they're not attached to an agency like HUD, where we have a lot more control over how we could do this. <laughs> that we might be able to take some some mm -hmm. look at how we could actually very specifically target. Um, and, and open up some opportunities for the immigrant communities, mm -hmm. perhaps with ARPA dollars that we haven't yet all allocated, rather than use the HUD ARP. Rather than go through suggesting? this avenue. Yes. Yeah, because, I mean, we still have some opportunities there. I will, I will say that, you know, there was a bunch of needs <laughs> mm -hmm. that we still didn't fund. So that's me making a statement without really looking at all of the great things that we wanted to do that we still fell short. I saw the the rest of the money were still have many things under it. I saw that we still have affordable housing under no money, and we still have like many things that we have to accomplish through the four million dollar left, right? Correct. So, a, affordable housing is the biggest category that we're working on right now. And and you said four million? No, it's not four million. I think affordable housing was. Mm, million and a half mm -hmm. uh, roughly is our target and and we we're going to take from that money that we thought maybe this is our chance to do some kind of affordable housing and now we have this opportunity we can do and I think Mayor Pro Tem, it's important at this stage in the process to I mean I have a real concern about delaying the distribution of this money given that it's been two years and maybe the energy can be around the fact that um, those who you're concerned aren't being able to receive the funds, right? Um, because I'm hearing two different things. One is immigrant-led organizations, but the other is immigrants in our community who aren't receiving the rental assistance. So the first one, I feel like with this particular restricted pot of funds, my I'm saying I'm not comfortable waiting or reopening that. But to the second point, all of these organizations don't exclude immigrants. I understand and I appreciate and I agree with you that there is a problem with people knowing what's available and having the opportunity to, to access those funds, right? But at this stage, if the money is about to go out the door, I think we can try and encourage those organizations to ensure that they're doing the outreach to get to those communities that you're concerned aren't being reached right now. But there is no, like, are they, this fund will be for renter assistance? So there's the legal aid um, the program legal for supportive services for all all the um, qualified populations. So that includes homeless individuals, individuals at risk of homelessness, low-income individuals, and individuals fleeing domestic violence. I, I'm familiar with the Iowa legal aid, but um, I'm saying those for maybe like if somebody have a problem, but they are not giving out rental assistance. Right. None of these programs are specifically rental assistance programs. That's what I am saying. Like, still, there is no programs that will, will help the immigrants. I, I think that's not the case. I, I think that there's not one specifically for rental assistance. That is true. And to the mayor's point, we have many, many needs that we are not the experts of. Those who submitted the application say, here's the need, here's what we can do to meet it, this is the funding that we require for those programs. And those are not excluding immigrants. Absolutely work needs to be done to include them more, right? I, I saw this is an opportunity. Yeah, I, I understand. I, I, I'm just trying I, to I feel like really this is an opportunity, and uh, now you you are adding those two organizations, uh, like now, and you're going to send it to HUD, right? So the plan would be if if this is approved, we would send the plan to HUD, and and they would review it and would tell you yes. if they are okay with it, or maybe they will send it back to you again. We're pretty confident they're going to be okay with it because they've already reviewed it. And why you are not confident that if you allocate it to renter assistant, is my not? So when we did our needs assessment, actually the agencies that we consulted with did not identify tenant-based rental assistance as a priority for this population. They identified. 
um, congregate shelter for domestic violence victims. Who, identify who identify that? The folks that were consulted in the needs assessment. And who's those folks? It was all the, the, the agencies that serve these populations. Oh, you consult those only? It was a pretty ex expansive um, needs assessment. It's all in the allocation plan. It doesn't matter everyone here how they're going to vote. I'm going to just vote it for a record again. I think this is an opportunity. I feel like all the immigrants organization or immigrants, they did not benefit a lot from this Arba money, especially the organization who applied. They did not be like a lot of them, they don't know about it. If I don't know about it, many of them, they don't know about it. So I, I, I think this is an opportunity, and I hope we can do allocate it to our rental assistance and submit the application that way. Okay. That's my position. All right. So any more questions for Sam? Quick one. Just a quick one, time-wise. Um, we've been talking about timing and the time it's taken so far, uh, and that these were originally allocated in 21. Um, when was the actual process? Was it also earlier in 21? This kind of predates my time on council. It, it predates my time working here also. I believe it was in 21. Okay, I, just, I was just curious because yeah. I, I, I didn't come on until after that. Probably, or my guess would be early 21 um, is when we would have started that. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? It. And if you're online, please raise your virtual hand if you wish to speak. Seeing no one online or in person, council discussion. I just I think it's just prudent for the record, the agencies that were consulted for this, we can run through it real quick. Um, Johnson, County, Johnson County Homeless Coordinating Board, Shelter House, Domestic Violence Intervention Program, Iowa Legal Aid, Iowa City Housing Authority, Johnson County Affordable Housing Coalition, Hawkeye Area Community Action Program, Inside Out Reentry, Johnson County Social Services, Housing Trust Fund of Johnson County, Waypoint, the Housing Fellowship, the Institute for Community Alliances, Anonymous, uh, Veterans Affairs, Abbey Health, United Action for Youth, and Amerigroup, as well as NAMI, but and, com and community, but no specific uh, comments about priority were given by uh, community. And none America. of the immigrants group was consulted. We're always out. I'm not sure who's all on the Jones County um, Coordinating Board. Yeah. Just reading yeah. the plan. We, Mayor, we don't have a lot of immigrants-led organization here. We know them by heart. There's none of them on that list. No, I was referring to the the Johnson County Coordinating Board. It. I don't. I don't know if um, CWJ is a part of that. No. Oh, they're not. Okay. They are not. Okay. Okay. I guess we're at a. Yeah, council can make um, comments. Um, but soon I'll, um, once I feel like the conversation is slowing down, then I'll take us to a vote. I would um, piggyback on what Councilor Burgess had said that um, there's, there's two streams. One is about the immigrant-led organizations and there's one about the needs from different immigrant communities. And having been on HCDC at one point, I'm familiar with how stringent HUD is. Um, often they did recapture funds, or if, if the agencies weren't um, performing in the ways that were expected um, and staff had to navigate that. Um, I, I want those individuals and and to, to get the help that they need, while also saying there needs to be, I believe, a concerted effort to reach out to immigrant communities so that they know that these funds are available. And I understand that it's not rental assistance, but I think in addition, if we can look at what we have not allocated through ARPA dollars to see in, and I know um, I wasn't like, like um, Sean had said, I wasn't um, on council, but I remember actually filling out the survey, the, the public survey about how should ARPA dollars be spent. 
Um, and there were a lot of different needs and a lot of winnowing down. But I think that that's a place where we could look to see how can we very specifically reach out to those who have fallen through the cracks. Um, so I, I am in favor of pushing this forward. I had some questions about the specific allocations. So a different um, situation, um, but given sort of the, the, the timeline and the fact that this is attached to HUD, that's the sticking point for me. Um, I'm, I'm, I will approve as is. Um, understanding that this is because it will be helping individuals who need it and we need to use our own influence to say that there needs to be a concerted effort to reach out to additional communities. Yes, can you explain, like you said when you was in the commission, you know that this organization have to be compliant because how can you explain that a little bit? Oh, I'm just saying any organization, I know that there were, um, the HUD as a federal agency has a lot of stringent regulations. I'm not thinking of any specific one in general. I just know that there were money, we would allocate home funds and um, for actually a lot of, it was for um, capital improvement. No, you, you, are you suggesting that maybe immigrants led organization they don't have the capacity oh, and no, they are no. not complying? Or no, I guess nothing, nothing. that's the way I understood oh, it. Oh, no, I'm sorry that you misunderstood that. That's not at all what I was saying. What I was saying is that there were agencies who received home funds from HUD who were not able to make the, the, the compliance or what have you within a timeline, or usually that was it, was it within a timeline, and so those funds were recaptured or had to be. But no, no, I, I apologize if that's what I, if it, yeah. that was not what I intended at all. No problem. I, I think, you know, certainly you're bringing up um, a point that needs attention and intentionality. For what's before us today, I think, given the time frame and what I heard from you was HUD um, has some stringent, <laughs> you know, uh, rules, um, and it had nothing to do with any particular entity. But um, I'm, I'm going to support this, but I do hear the intentionality of what we need to be doing um, you know, to ensure that everyone is included in our community. I think that makes some sense, Mayor. And I think the the point about having time to do this, if we were not working with federal a federal organization, especially like HUD, it would seem like a lot of time. But since it's already taken them three years to get this far, I mean, that makes I, I would hate to see all of this go away, this, this entire opportunity go away. But I think we really do need to take um, to take a real, real careful listen and directed action as we as we do this. Um, again, I'm not throwing any stones, but I mean, um, you know, it's a shame this conversation didn't happen back in 2021 um, when really could have um, maybe made a difference. Of course, you know, uh, that's it would probably wouldn't even be having this conversation if HUD was efficient. <laughs> like, and we, you know, we, this would have been been done by now. But uh, but I think it's an important conversation to have, and I'm, I'm really grateful to. Uh, uh, Councilor Sully for uh, bringing that up and, and really, really um, uh, putting your foot down on this issue because I think it's it's really important. Um, but I don't want to see all these funds because it takes so long to get through this federal process. I wouldn't want to see these funds disappear um, because that would hurt everybody, including the immigrant population that these funds would serve. Uh, and so I will also be supporting it with the caveat of all the things I just mentioned. Councilor Sully. Um would you be uh, amenable to, you know, us taking a look at some of those other unallocated DARPA dollars um, and exploring other opportunities with with those and approving this as it is due to um, those funky stuff with HUD that's going on? Would that be something that you'd be open to and excited about? If I'm going to be single out today, I'm voting no for this, and there is another opportunity, I would say yes, maybe one day we can fulfill the need of the immigrants. Okay. I'm not going to reject to any opportunity, but still I'm sad this is going this way. Yeah, understood. Roll call, please. 
Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Mo? Yes. Sele? No. Teague? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Motion passes six to one. We are at item number 11, which is council appointments. 11A is the Ad Hoc Truth and Reconciliation Commission. One vacancy to fill an unexpired term upon appointment ending December 31st, 2024. Um, there is a one male gender required. Um, and we only have two appointments today, so we'll just take them one by one. Uh, I received a phone call from Amos, mm -hmm. um, which he, pre he, he got to me before I got to his application. Um, had a lovely conversation with him. He's deeply familiar and experienced with the TRC. He has a really impressive resume. Um, I feel good, very good about him. I agree. Agreed. Could support that. He also reached out um, probably to several of us, but mm -hmm. yes, he yeah. reached out. I was really trying to appoint somebody, but I, like, I, I want to say Lubna Muhammad, but she is a female. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just believe that also on these commissions, what I've been seeing when, the, when they came here and present, the only population that they did not reach out to is the student East community. And, and also, like, they, they said they have something in English, they have something, like, in, in Spanish, and all. So I, she said in and I saw if she, but that, I don't know. But at the end of the day, the, the gender requirement. But I believe we should have, have also representation there, because those kind of the people, when they are in commission, they would remind the rest <laughs> of the commission, as if I'm reminding you right now about immigrants. So we need that representation in each commission. But unfortunately, it is gender requirement. Mm -hmm. So yep. I, I, he's, he's Ken, Kenyan. He's a, Kenyan. A, a, yeah. Hmm? A, Amos is Kenyan. Amos is a, I know. But we have many African Kenyans there, but we don't have Arabic speaker there. Yeah. That's so true. That's, true. that's what I'm saying. Representation. That's it. <laughs> All right. So sound like there's a majority for Amos. Um, why don't we just go to, um, we'll just do it one by one. C could I get a motion to appoint Amos Keish? Move. We'll move. Second. All right. <laughs> All right, so move by uh, Mo, seconded by Sala. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes seven to zero. I just heard noise from over here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Tired. It's all become a long all right. day. Yes. All right. 11B, Board of Appeals. One vacancy to fill, um, one vacancy for an HVAC or building design professional or a qualified trade representative with experience and training. If after three, okay, uh, to fill a five-year term, January 1st, 2024, uh, through December 31st, 2028, and there is no gender requirement, and there's one applicant. Right. I, I think he's pretty swell. <laughs> yes. I, I support him. Is that, just a quick question, does that meet the... Uh, meet the needs for this position? No, just, I, I wasn't 100% clear reading the uh, occupation is attorney and... So, let's... Point, oh, point. Point. No, I mean, not the gender requirement, okay. the... Uh, no, just this the, one, the, just the, the professional, professional requirement. Yeah, yeah. Does that meet the HVAC uh, professional was the... Am I right? Do I remember that right? Yeah, you're right. The or use. build and design professional or qualified trade representative. So, I mean, the, the, his occupation is attorney, so I don't know, does that... Does, I, I, this is not a bad thing. I'm not, I, I'm not dissing the no, guy. I just don't know if he fits the... Good question. Yeah, and I didn't uh, speak with this person. And probably wonderful. I'm just, again, just going off of what the, the thing says. The are. Well, looking at the application, um, I think he may recognize that same limitation because when asked about experience owner and or activities, which you feel qualify you for this position, he said, uh, quote, work with building codes and other real estate statutes on a regular basis, close quote. Um, I don't know if that gets you there. I, I think that's open to interpretation and the interpretation should be yours as a council. 
So this one has been open since, like, if the first appointment date was October, it's been open since, what, a couple, a month or so before then? Oh, that was the announcement, sorry. Application dead, deadline was December 5th, so we would have had it on the December, I think it was the 12th oh. meeting if we had any applications, which we, I don't believe we did. Um, and then the January 2nd, the January 16th, and then tonight's meeting. Yeah. The so the... The intro to this in the packet says that if after three months no professional applies or is appointed, so is that is that why we're looking at this now? When does the clock start? Typically, and Eric can confirm, we would go by the announcement date. Like with the gender requirement, we go by the announcement date and then 90 days. Um, I believe that's right. I, I would still question whether he'd be considered a qualified trade representative. As an attorney. I'd be open to leaving it open. Maybe? Oh, I see. I read it wrong. So apologies. Yeah, that's fine. That? Many people are not yeah, so I'm okay maybe. leaving it open. I, I think Trying that there's enough. Trying to promote it a little more. Yeah. It, it appears that we would only have, I mean, the 90 days have already went by. But if we can give it another month, if we want to just say one month and then. Do we know if we have, like, quorum issues on that board? Question. Uh, so it's a yeah, it's a board of five. Okay, but the other four are filled. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's what I'd suggest that we maybe leave it open another month and Maybe. do a couple social media posts about it. And we so add it, add it to the March agenda. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Deferred till March. Do we need a motion for that? March Remember. I think it's the nineteenth. So we'll. So we'll um, defer to March. I don't have a calendar before. I believe it's the 19th. 19th. March 19th. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Moved by Don. Seconded by Burgess. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 7 to 0. We're going to move on to item number 12, which is announcement of vacancies previous. Charter Review Commission 9 vacancies to fill a one-year term beginning April 1st, 2024 and ending no later than April 1st, 2025. Applications must be received by 5 p.m. Tuesday, February 13th, 2024. Airport Zoning Board of Adjustment on vacancy to fill a five-year term. Airport Zoning Commission on vacancy to fill a six-year term. Historic Preservation Commission East College Street. One vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Historic Preservation Commission Jefferson Street. One vacancy to fill a three year term. Historic Preservation Commission Woodlawn Avenue. One vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Public Art Advisory Committee. One vacancy to fill a three year term. Public Art Advisory Committee. One vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Senior Center Commission. One vacancy to fill a three year term. Vacancies will remain open until filled. Item number 13 of City Council information. Hearing none, we're going to go to item number 14, reports on items from city staff. Nothing tonight, Mayor. All right, we'll go uh, city attorney. Nothing from me either, thank you. City clerk. Ditto. All right. And then Item number 15 is adjournment. Could I get a motion to adjourn? Now, just remember, we will be going back into work session, but we'll take a five-minute break. So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> Moved by Don. You're closer. Second <laughs> by Alter. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is passes.